So I'll tell you uh, how I came up with this, uh, this little title for this. Uh, there was a partner in Boston who I shall not name, you know, and they used to do a hardware consultancy. And when I would walk into their offices, right in the front, they had this little plaque that said, hardware is hard, right? And I said, boy, this is not true, right? You know, you're scaring people away, right? So I said, you know, let's go figure out a way to make hardware products soft or like kind of easy, right? And so I said, okay, we need to go do something. And this is where I started kind of going through my head as to why hardware is different, how to make hardware, you know, really easy, right? So that's what I've been uh, working uh, in my career. So, uh, and before we get into hardware and how hardware products are different than software products and how you manage them differently, I think it's really important to understand what product management is at the end, right? You know, when I was starting out my career and for most of my career, there was no such thing as product managers, right? There really wasn't. At all the companies that I worked at, there was no body who had a title product manager right? It was just engineers, and that's it, and some product marketing people. And that's all what they used to do. And somewhere along the line, people figured out whatever engineers would design wasn't sufficient in the marketplace, right? Functionality was kind of the lowest common denominator that you needed to succeed, but you had to go way beyond that, right, to really have a hit product. And that's how I think really product management, at least in hardware product and the kind of products in consumer electronics that I have been building, all started. And so what I call product management in my view is really about owning the product. What I mean by owning the product, I mean owning the outcomes of a product, right? If, if the product is successful, then you have to make sure you share the success with everybody who contributed to the product. If it bombs, unfortunately, which a lot of products do, then it's the product manager's job to own up to it and say, you know what, I screwed up, right? That's really what it is. And you have to be willing to sign up for that kind of a job where you can spread the good stuff and take responsibility for all the not so good stuff that happens, right? You really have to own up uh, to the overall success. And by the way, you have to know all everything that goes into making a product successful, right? So it's not just, hey, I'm an engineer. No, I'm an engineer, I'm a salesperson, I'm a marketing person, I am doing everything, right? I have to have a good enough knowledge and an understanding of everything, right? And, and this is the reason why I tell everybody, uh, you know, product management is not something that is taught in school. Really, if you go to MIT or Stanford and you can do a PhD, you still have no idea how to build a product and bring it to market, right? Putting a box of cereal on the shelf, I can tell you from experience, is way more difficult than doing a PhD at MIT, right? I don't know if there are any MIT PhDs here, but I, kill, I tell it to them as well. It is actually, putting a box of cereal on the shelf is way more difficult because you don't learn it anywhere, right? it is extremely, extremely difficult. You're gonna to have to use skills that nobody ever taught you, right? You're gonna to have to learn a lot of this and there's no other way other than experience, right? And having gone through the process a few times and gonna learn it the hard way. And, and this is the reason why when I heard of product school, I was so happy that at least there is somebody who is willing to impart the knowledge and the experience, right? And telling, training people, sharing the wealth of knowledge that exists, how to go build products, right? And by the way, every product here that you will see has an interesting story behind them. These are all products that I have built. I have some samples too that I'm very happy to share, but you know, the stories behind them are actually very interesting. And they're all examples of the success took a lot of product management. In fact, how these products were even conceived had a lot to do with, uh, really with product management at the end. A lot of the innovation that happened was in product management rather than engineering, 
right? So we will come back to some of these, uh, and I'll tell you stories on these as, uh, as time permits. So before I get going, right, you know, let me tell you how I got into product management, because I think that's an, uh, an interesting story. So I, you know, I still consider myself a geek. I'm a geek, I love to do geeky stuff. And when I was at Motorola, I had this little Skunk Works project going on, right? Which is, I was involved in very early before, uh, you know, when I was still in school in doing Wi-Fi, right? You know, before it was called Wi-Fi. So I always had this, even though I was doing cellular now, I still had a little affinity towards doing Wi-Fi. And on my, with my little team of two or three people, I'm working on this, you know, hey, I would, it would be cool to do voice over IP or Wi-Fi. This is like 20 years ago, right? People said, wow, this is a piece of crap. No, no, you could never do this. Technically, it will never work, right? So we filed maybe a dozen patents. We said, I even built a prototype and said, yeah, look, it works. And by the way, it's actually pretty cool. So one of our senior VPs, I convinced him, hey, this is very cool. Maybe it can be a product. So Sanjay, you know what? You're a geek. You really don't understand anything about selling this thing. Let me go find you somebody who understands business to work with you. So let's go make a product, right? So he, he goes and he asks, he spent six months looking to find somebody who's gonna work with Sanjay to go bring this phone with Wi-Fi and voice over IP to market. Guess what happened, right? So I have this thing and in those days, about 20 years ago, right, people are spending billions of dollars buying Spectrum and they look at this Wi-Fi stuff, which is free and you're gonna do free calls. Like, are you guys crazy? No chance, right? No chance we're gonna ever let you do anything like this. In fact, they became openly hostile, right? All of these friends at all these carriers in the US who I knew very well, right? You know, at very senior levels, they look at me and say, Sanjay, you are our biggest enemy here right now, right? We're not touching this, we're gonna kill this thing right here, right now, we're gonna fill it out, we're gonna figure it out. So none of the business guys wanna touch or work with me. So my boss's boss comes to me and says, Sanjay, after six months of trying very hard to find somebody, Sanjay, I can't find anybody who's willing to work with you and risk their careers to do this with you because they have no business. There's no chance. Not only they don't believe in this, they're gonna actively be like killing this product. So he added, says, Sanjay, okay, there's only one option, right? You know, since there's nobody who's willing to work with you and it's not because of you, it's because of all this other stuff that you're doing, there's only two options I have. We either kill this thing or you can go run the business yourself and go do whatever you feel like, right? So I thought about it for a second and said, no, you know, Bill, just give it to me. Let me try my hand at it, right? I'm a geek. I try this and I said, you know what? Let me go figure something out, right? So that was my first thing, learning to take a technology and make it into a product, right? I never went to any school, I never had any training, nothing, right? I just got thrown into the deep end with a long rope that I thought was, you know, I was gonna hang myself with at the end, right? That's what everybody thought was gonna happen. So, uh, and this is the first phone, by the way, what you see is this is the world's first phone with voice over IP and Wi-Fi. This is about 18 years old phone now, maybe 17, right? Uh, and the first phone in the US that actually was running Linux and Java, so precursor to Android. Really Android, you know, a lot of Android came out of here. Uh, so we'll, I can, I'm happy to pass this around. It probably doesn't even power up anymore. Uh, but this is my favorite phone because this is my first, uh, my first product, right? So we'll come to this in a second. But let me share with you my philosophy of product management, right? I told you I didn't go into any school, so I just made this up as I was based on my experience, right? For any product to be viable, right? For you to succeed as a product manager, there are three things that you have to always balance, right? And you have to align the study. One of them is not balanced, you are in trouble. 
since I'm a geek, I'll start with the feasibility, right? Feasibility, what I mean by feasibility is technically it's doable, right? You know, you're trying to do something that you're not violating some fundamental laws of physics or it's not going to kill people and all of this other stuff that can happen, right? So it has to be technically feasible. But being technically feasible doesn't mean it's a good product to do, right? The next thing you have to worry about, and you can do this in any order, doesn't matter, is somebody has to want it, right? If nobody wants this product, maybe technically feasible, who the heck cares about it, right? It's not worth doing if nobody cares about it, nobody wants it, right? So you have to worry about what I call needs. Needs of your customer, needs of your partners, whatever other needs, requirements in the marketplace that you have. There has to be some demand somewhere. If you really strongly believe, you can actually try and create some demand too, but you have to solve that piece, right? But that itself is, so having a need and have, you know, being feasible to do doesn't necessarily mean you still have a product. What is the most important job in a business? Money. Yeah, exactly. You have to make money, right? You know, business exists to make money. If you can't make a business, I'm not interested in it, to be honest, too, right? I'm in the business of making money. We should all remember this, right? This is why a product manager's biggest job is to go make some money for the business. So you better figure out a way to get some return, right? You have to make some money. What it means is you can make money by selling it for more than what it took to create it, right? It's pretty simple stuff. So this is the triangle that you have to balance, right? You have to be able to make money, right? So you have to be able to make money. You have to be able to build it. And somebody has to want it. And all three of, none of this is one, one is not more important than the other. All of three of them are equally, equally important, right? So let's go back to this phone, by the way, right? I thought when I was an engineer, I only did this piece. And I was so happy, hey, look, I got something really cool. Except people weren't quite sure who needed it. And certainly I had no idea how to make money, right? Even if I could create the need, by the way, I could tell people, right? I could go stand at a train station and say, hey, I, you could buy this phone and make free phone calls from this all day with Wi-Fi at your home. People say, yeah, I want it, right? Except nobody was going to pay me money to do this or make money. And there was no way certainly I could make, sell enough of these at a train station that I could actually make any real dollars for the company at the end, right? And what it meant was I have to go find a channel to sell it. And that channel wasn't willing to certainly not allow me to sell it. They, in fact, wanted to kill this product right away, right? So what did I, have, what did I do? How did this thing even come to life then, right? So the first thing that I did was I'm scratching my head and saying, OK, so certainly every customer that my business talks to, they certainly don't want it, right? I think the consumers want it. That was at least putting myself in the shoe of a consumer. Who doesn't like free? Who wants to pay money to a, a carrier, right? Nobody wants to, right? So I think I can create some demand, but I just don't know how to make any money and do anything. So I scratched my head a little bit and I realized you know what, maybe there are some people who don't own Spectrum who may want something like this, right? So guess what I did? I went to all the cable companies, right? You know, Comcast and Cablevision and, you know, there are all these companies who want to offer mobility, who want to offer, you know, smart, cool-looking devices rather than those crappy old phones, right? And... You say, look, you can have this thing, and by the way, it can be a really cool service that you have, and you're offering some voice over IP stuff already, right? At your home, you can have a form factor that looks like this. By the way, it can also have cellular in it. And they said, you know what? Yeah, this is cool. I'm willing to pay something, right? So I actually created a model where I could satisfy the need, but I have to go through a different channel to go sell my product, 
right, who are going to, and these are guys certainly who have the money who can allow me to sell a few million of these where I can make some real money, right? So that's the important thing about here is really you have to balance all three at the end. If you don't balance all three of them, which is the technical feasibility, which is the first challenge, at least from my background, right? Having a consumer need, customers have to want it, right? It's very difficult to get a customer to spend $100 out of their pocket. It's way more difficult than most people realize, right? Just because something is cool, nobody spends $100 on it. Uh, and then you have to be able to, to make money. And by the way, the, this part is actually not just specific to hardware, by the way. It's the same principles apply. This is kind of, I call it my product management 101, right? Hardware, software, any product you build, it better meet, it better learn how to balance these three requirements, right? That is absolutely the fundamental part. Okay, very good. We'll come back to product management in a second, but this is an important lesson that I learned, you know, and certainly a geek like me, this was a, a, a little bit of a revelation, uh, right? Which is when you're doing a job, right? There are a whole set of different behaviors that you have to exhibit to succeed, right? And one of the most important skills that I would encourage all of you become really, really good at is learning how to sell, right? You know, people think if your business card says salesperson or sales engineer or sales whatever, only then you need to learn sales, right? This was, again, you know, one of those myths that I had in my head too, right? I like sales is beneath me. No, 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 it's very important. You don't realize, right, every person is always selling something, right? What you may be selling is different. What you're expecting in return may be something different, but it is, you're always, every day, you're selling something, right? An engineer is selling his idea. He's looking for acceptance, right? A product manager's job, if you break it down, is all about selling, right? He is selling an idea, a vision of his product to engineers. He's tell, selling the, his vision of a product to his CFO or his CEO, why this can make money. He's selling the concept or the product that he wants to build to consumers, and he's going to sell it very differently. In fact, this is probably the most important job of a product manager. He is selling to a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise. He's going to have to learn to talk of a lot of different languages very quickly. Right? How you sell to an engineer and why do you motivate an engineering team to build a product for you is different than go talk to the CFO, right? Or go talk to somebody who's actually gonna buy this product or go talk to the distributor, go talk to the channel. Why should a retailer stock this product and put it on their shelf, right? It's a product manager's job to manage this entire product. Okay, somebody wants us to leave already, <laughs> right? So what I would really encourage everybody, right? Never lose sight of this fact that learning how to sell is a good thing, right? We all better get really, really good at. And you can, we can all be very good at selling, by the way. You just have to realize, what are you selling? You really ask the question, what am I selling today? When you go to work in the morning, think about what are the two things you're gonna be selling and to whom, and then how best to sell it to that person. Having that clarity in your head is extremely important for success, right? So it's a very, very important skill and something that everybody needs to know it, but for a product manager, you will not be able to do your job well until unless you learn how to become a really, really good salesperson and learn to sell it to different people with very different motivations at the end. Right? So extremely, extremely important. And I say it is an absolutely necessary skill. It's not sufficient. You can still fail, but if you don't know how to sell, you will never succeed. Right? So this is like, in my geeky way, necessary but not sufficient condition. Right? Very good. Okay. So now let's talk about what makes hardware different. Right? And 
a lot of you, you know, there are lots of books and lots of stuff that you will hear about product managing software products, right? And when I look at it and say, okay, why can't I apply all of the same principles that I learned to managing hardware? By default, you should always assume, yes, you can apply everything that you've learned, right? That's, that is where you should start from. And then you can say, okay, what makes hardware different than software? And how do I adjust what I know, right? So here are a few things that make hardware a little bit different. I'm not saying it's difficult. It's just a little bit different. Once you understand what the differences are, you know how to manage those, right? So don't let anybody tell you hardware is hard. No, hardware is just a little different maybe, right? So the first thing is everybody now knows, right? Nobody's doing a waterfall product development until unless you're maybe you're building an airplane or you're sending a rocket to Mars or something, right? We're all doing iterative product development, right? And that's what we do in hardware too nowadays, right? So I have never done a waterfall for any hardware in my 20 plus years of building product, right? What is different in hardware though, which is from software is each iteration takes time, right? Software iteration, I don't know how often do you, in your experience you do builds, you could be doing them every day, you could be doing them every week. Right? I don't see anybody who doesn't do a build, at least a full build every week if you're doing software. Right? When you're doing hardware, you don't do an iteration every week. And the reason why you don't want to do iteration every week is it takes time. You're going to have to build new housings, you're going to have to build boards, and you're going to have to do some uh, surface mount build PCBs and all of this other stuff. It takes time. Right? And even if you could do them, very often or every week, sometimes I've had to do that, they get very expensive very fast, right? Because you need a whole, you know, some kind of a manufacturing line, you need 20 people to sit down, assemble, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, in the last few years, some things have improved, by the way. Now I can do 3D printing that wasn't necessarily available 15 years ago. Right? So some of my mechanical and ID form factor prototyping has become a whole lot easier than it used to be. But still, I think, until unless we have some fundamental new innovation happen, you can rest assured that, look, hardware iterations are going to take longer, and they're way more expensive. Right? A typical iteration, I will tell you, if you're going to build in the US, probably about four weeks. That's the fastest you'll be able to do for any kind of mass production. If you go, have to go to Asia, you're probably six weeks, right? Because just building something is not sufficient. Then you also have to go test it and do all this other stuff, right? So it takes time before you can have good feedback to say, now I know what I, what I need to do differently, right? The other part which is different is manufacturing and supply chain, right? When you're building software, replicating pieces of code is very easy. Right? It can happen instantly. If I have one widget and I have to build a thousand, there's no machine that knows how to replicate them in like two seconds. Right? It may take you, you may not have enough parts, you may not have components, you may not have, you may find out, oh, you run out of uh, microprocessors or memory or even a, a little screw that is missing stops you from building a product. Right? So that's another level of complexity, just manufacturing, supply chain, cost, all of those things become issues that software doesn't have to deal with, right? So you have to really plan for all of this stuff up front, right? And understand how it's gonna impact how you're managing your processes. The other part that maybe is a little bit uniquely challenging for hardware is regulatory and safety concerns. Right? You know, in software, yes, you have this GDPR stuff. Now you have to worry about it. There are some things you have to worry about. But for hardware, it goes through the roof. You're worried about can a kid eat some of these parts? Can a kid pull some stuff out? Well, if you have a radio in it, you need to get FCC certification, CE certification. You know, there's no lead in the paint, no harmful chemicals here. It doesn't catch fire. There's so many different things that you have to deal with. In every country you sell, is going to have its own regulations, right? 
This is just what we have to deal with. Don't get intimidated by it. It's all relatively simple. You just got a plan. You just have to know, right? Getting your arms around the problem is what is the most important. Don't let it be all surprises a week before you're launching. Oh, I didn't uh, get approvals to sell this product in India. And uh, I have all my advertising agency and everybody all ready and to go, right? You can't do that, right? And regulatory and safety concerns are landmines that a lot of people forget. And by the way, some of this stuff you don't realize till you actually build a product and you test it and say, you know what? Emissions are not meeting, right? So radio emissions are too high. It's going to interfere with my radio or TV or Wi-Fi, and I can't launch it, right? So you really have to mitigate all of those risks early in the process. This is what makes hardware different, but it can be all planned for. And then uh, you should always remember hardware products almost always, at least I haven't built a hardware product in a long time, which didn't have some firmware and software and cloud and all of this other stuff to go with it, right? So in the end, a product is this full system rather than I built my PCB and I built some stuff and I'm good, right? So don't think in a hardware product manager doesn't understand all of the other stuff. Absolutely, you have to understand. Your job is to the overall success of the product, right? You have to learn how to do the whole thing. Okay, that was before you even launch it. What happens once you launch it? And this is where I say hardware is probably the most challenging one. When you're building hardware in today's world, you only have one opportunity to get this thing right. Right? Once you ship a device, you can't change its color, right? You can't change its form factor. You can't change, you know, and say, oops, I forgot to put a micro USB on this or I put some, you know, something small, right? Something could be really, really small. Nothing you can do about it. It's all gone. You built a million of these or whatever and you cannot update them. Software, right? You have a software, you find a bug in it. You can have an update roll around the next morning and everybody's happy, right? You can do live A-B testing like Google and Facebook and all these guys are doing. In hardware, you can do this thing in the field. You have to have a different level of confidence when you launch the product, right? You can't have 100 million flavors of everything. You've got to decide what other two things you're going to do and how you're going to do this, right? And then... Anytime you build hardware, and this is what scares everybody, by the way, is inventory. In software, when you build software, there is no inventory, right? You know, you can do replication of code on the fly and you can ship it on the internet and everybody has it, right? When you're building hardware, you gotta plan for it. You gotta decide how much am I gonna build? How many parts am I gonna buy, right? And too little, if you build too little, then you got a customer demand that you can't satisfy and you're leaving money on the table, right? No business wants to do this. You build too much, the problem is even worse. I've had situations where you have $10 million of inventory sitting in a warehouse and saying, scratching, and what am I gonna do with this, right? The first time you as a product manager has to deal with it emotionally, you got $10 million of something sitting in a warehouse and you say, holy cow, I can't ship this, right? You're gonna have a sleepless night. And you better get learn how to get comfortable with that, right? Because if you can't get comfortable with it, you won't be able to figure out how to deal with that situation, right? The stress is just going to kill you, right? So it's very difficult. It's very difficult. This is, these are really the, the challenges of, you can try and mitigate it, right? This is why you can do over the air update for firmware on most of these products now, right? That helps. It can fix bugs. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is, right, which has happened to me once, by the way, which is you launch a product and the government or somebody comes and says, you know what? You're going to have to do a recall. There is a problem. Right? You all heard of recalls, right? Recalls are like the ugliest, ugliest situation that you can ever imagine when you're building a hardware product that the government says or somebody says, you know what? Or you decide yourself. <sighs> There's a bug. Consumers are really unhappy about this, and you're going to have to recall it. Just please, bring, the risk is so high that you have to say, 
bring it all back. I'm going to, you know, it's, it's a, it hurts your brand name. It hurts your bottom line. It hurts your own personal reputation. It hurts everything, right? Nobody's going to be happy. So the threshold that you have to think through when a product manager says, you know what, I'm ready to launch this product, right? That's a lot of burden. If you just sit back and just think about it, right? A week before or maybe the night before the product is going to officially launch and you're gonna stand on a stage and you're gonna show this piece, beautiful piece off and everything, you have to make a decision. Is this product ready or not, right? And this is not a five, ten dollar, hundred dollar, thousand dollar decision usually. It is, we're talking millions and millions of dollars, right? Depending on the scale. Uh, it's not for the weak of heart, right? Uh, and I've had to make decisions, right? And you know, I'm gonna tell you another secret, by the way. No product, whether hardware, software that I know has ever launched where you can say there are no bugs in this thing, right? There's not one product that I've ever done that I believe nobody's ever launched that you can say with certainty that there are zero bugs in it. Every product, in my experience, you sit down the day before you launch or the week before you launch with your quality team and say, okay, tell me all the bugs that there are on this list, right? And they're going to walk me through, Sanjay, we got 20 bugs in this thing and this whole laundry list of stuff. And you, as a product manager, has to decide, do I launch it? Do I not launch it, right? If you launch it and it has real problems, you got egg on your face, right? If you don't launch it, your CFO is saying, okay, Sanjay, where is the product? There's all this money and revenue and margin that we were expecting and it's on our books and the whole market and the street is expecting it. Where is it, right? This is like a no-win situation. So you really got to make these tough calls. As, as, and it's all a product manager, like nobody else's job. It's a product manager's job to figure out what is he or she going to do at that point in time. And this is what makes hardware different, right? It's the little stuff that makes hardware different. It's not little, it becomes big. It just requires you to have a different level of maturity and confidence in the product that you're going to launch, right? And for this reason, you have to put processes in place where you can get validation of your product before you launch it, right? So one of the things that at least that I do is we talked about iterations, right? I've never launched a hardware product without doing at least three iterations, right? And by the way, if you, if you say my product is perfect in the first iteration, then I say there's something wrong with your process because that means you're not taking enough risk in that product, right? If it was so simple that you could get it right in the first time, it's probably not worth doing, right? So I at least every product that I do, I would say you should plan for three iterations, right? The first iteration is, I'm building, I have a vision of my product, I kind of wrote down a product requirements document, whatever, and I build it. The engineers go build it, right? And the engineers most of the time will say, Sanjay, this is how we spec the feature and we built it. Whether somebody needs it or wants it is a different situation. They'll just say, this was the spec and I built this. And they're very happy, right? So the first iteration is to just say, can the engineers build what they said they were gonna build or what you told them to build, right? And I let what I call engineers do their engineering testing on it, right? Can they at least build to what was pegged out on a piece of paper, right? I never give that engineering build to a customer ever, right? Uh, one of the things that I learned in hardware is it's easier to tell a customer the product doesn't work than to give somebody half working something because then trying to tell why it doesn't work and all of this stuff is such a big mess, they will just, they will not trust you. It's easier to tell them it doesn't work and I'm not ready to give it to you and they'll be fine with it. Maybe they won't be too happy, but you can manage it. But managing a half working product or a half working sample is looking for a disaster, right? So, so never do that. The first iteration is always, hey, look, this is for my own internal testing and we're gonna do it that way, right? Me, if I'm running engineering as well, I would get one or two samples to see how it's doing, what additional feedback that I can get. But again, this is just 
kind of in the family at that stage, right? The next iteration that I build is something that I say and I insist on, let's give it to some people who don't have an emotional attachment to this product, right? You know, me and my engineering team, they all are emotionally attached. This is our baby, right? We're never gonna call it ugly. It's important to have some people tell you, you know what, this is wrong and this is wrong and this could be better and this other thing could be better, right? It's good to get this independent feedback because if you wait till the end and you launch this thing, this could get really ugly very fast. So it's better to get feedback early rather than after you spend the millions and millions of dollars, right? So you let it out, you give it to some people who don't believe in the product. Give it to your friends or family, right? I've always given a lot of the products since I was in consumer electronics, I give it to my kids and say, go use it, right? Just don't go put a picture of it on the Instagram or something else, but you can go use it and tell me what you think. And, and my son is sitting there smiling, uh, <laughs> right? And kids have given me the ugliest feedback, right? Uh, my wife has given me ugliest feedback. My engineers' uh, families have given us feedback that you say, you know what? Why did I not think of this, right? Because they're not attached. They're not thinking of it from the way you think, right? But you, that's my easiest way for me to really get consumer feedback in whatever little science experiment that I can create. And you sit down with all of that feedback, good and bad and ugly, and then a product manager's job is to go prioritize it, right? And say, these three things can be done. These five things can't be done. If I can't do these five things, do I still launch this product or do I just kill this product, right? I've ha actually... I've had cases where I killed a product based on the user feedback that we got, and we said, you know, it's not worth launching it. It's just waiting. It's a recipe for disaster waiting to happen, right? Go back to the drawing board. It's better to do it, go back to the drawing board then rather than launch it and then lose 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars and then have to re-engineer it in any case. So you waste time, you waste money, and you're kind of in a snake and ladders game, right? You're back to square one again. So these are all the things that you really have to, have to worry about. Okay. So I'll tell you what I have learned in my years. And there's a lot of learnings. I could go on for like hours on this stuff, right? When you're dealing with hardware products, and they're not only hardware, as I said. There's hardware, software, firmware, cloud services, apps nowadays also to go and so on, right? Learn to simplify the problem. As an engineer, when I was growing up, right, everybody would be proud that they solved a difficult problem, right, and how difficult the problem is and how smart they were that they solved this awesome, awesome, challenging problem. As a product manager, I hate that. I want to solve all the simple stuff, right? There is no, the, you should take pride in having success in the product rather than solving a most difficult problem that nobody cares about, right? So this is a different mindset. Embrace simplicity. Ask yourself the question, is this difficult thing really worth doing, right? So anytime somebody says, I'm doing this thing for the first time or this is so difficult, you should really step back and ask the question, is it worth doing it? Your flag should be going up as a product manager. Okay, this is a risk. If this guy is so smart, he's saying nobody else has done this, it automatically means there's a pretty high risk here. Right? So you should, you should start hearing things differently as a product manager, right? An engineer is very proud. He's telling you, look, I'm going to do this awesome, awesome job that nobody else has ever done. As a product manager, I am freaking out at this point, right? So your job is to simplify, solve the problems, not in a difficult way, the easiest way possible, right? That is by far the most important thing. As a product manager, embrace Simplicity, make it simple. There is nothing challenging about making a problem more difficult than it needs to be, right? And this also includes, by the way, when you're building a product, especially in hardware, right, or even software, when you go buy it, it's in a box. The box can only have three things on it, right? So instead of having 20 features that you don't even have space to advertise and educate a customer about, who needs them? Get all of those out, right? Save them for the future. Just do three things right and tell the world about it and you'll be able to sell more, 
rather than all the other stuff, right? Again, that's part of the simplification, really understanding what are you looking to do when you, how are you gonna sell this product? Think about it that way and then go, right? So go back to the needs and returns uh, and, and feasibility thing. What does the consumer want? Only two or three things that they want. Only two or three things I can tell them, right? Go back to the same thing. The other thing which I like to do is, and this is a way sometimes to achieve simplification, though I've been bit by it once in my life, which is modularize, right? Learn to break a big problem into smaller chunks that you hope and pray they are independent, right? So this is again where a good product manager can say this part is independent or most of, you know, I can have a team work on this independently of the other team, right? Create smaller chunks of problems that are solved rather than have this one big massive thing that can overwhelm everyone the best of uh, teams, right? Uh, learn how to do that. It's extremely important. You know, so one of the things that worked very well for me, except one time I got bit is, you know, when you're building a product like this, I can separate my electrical design from my mechanical design, right? The form factor, the ID, as long as I know how much space I need and so on, I can send the team to work on that independently, right? Color and shape and finish and a lot of this stuff can be done independently of the electrical design. Except one product, which is my favorite one, I'll show it to you guys, is, uh, you know, these were the first headsets. This is a product actually that I did not launch, by the way, right? I killed it, the, you know, literally like the evening before it was gonna launch, right? These were headsets that are actually in the market now, not this from other vendors, where you put this in your, uh, in your ear and it also measures heart rate from your ears, right? Have, have any of you tried those uh, headsets? So this is about, I did this product, I would say about 10 years ago, right? So nobody had done this thing and I'm like, yeah, I can do this thing. And I made the mistake of saying I can separate mechanical from my firmware design, right? Bad mistake because how this headset fits in your ear and how it is going to interact with your skin, which is where you get your heart rate from and you need to run all your firmware algorithms to get the heart rate, those two were absolutely could not have been separated, right? The entire team, and I take responsibility for it, we were not smart enough to have recognized this early enough. So you build this thing and you have your firmware and it doesn't work to the level of accuracy that we had set out to meet, right? So it's a subjective decision. Do you launch something that works good 95% of the time or do you want 99% of the time, right? It's a subjective call. It's not that it doesn't work. It worked, but does it work good enough, right? Is this something that you can be proud of? At the end, I have always looked at products that I have launched in a very personal, myopic standpoint. Am I going to be proud to have my name associated with this product, right? And if I say no, this is not what I want to be known for, then you just take your lumps and put it in your pocket and say nobody else is gonna see the light of, you know, nobody else is gonna see this product, right? It's a very personal decision, you know, and I want every product manager to think that way, right? Don't put the ball in somebody else's court. Hey, can I put the Motorola brand on it? No, each individual is their own brand name, right? Each product manager needs to own their product. They need to say, is this good enough for them? Does it meet their own expectations of the product that they're going to launch? Right? In hindsight, by the way, we probably should have launched this. Right? Ten years later, I, I would be, you know, I, I would say I made a mistake. We probably should have launched this because given the technology, after, even after its evolution over the last ten years, it hasn't become any substantially better. Right? But again, you know, when you are early in the game, you're the first one, you're gonna make some mistakes and you're, you know, you're gonna to have to live with this, right? So to me, I, I keep this as an example in my pocket all the time because it makes you humble every now and then. You may have done great things, but things like this, right? You know, these are subjective calls you have to make, right? Uh, the other thing which I learned uh, is what I call just-in-time decision-making. 
And what I mean by just-in-time decision-making is we all want to make decisions. A product manager is going to say, no, I'm going to make all these decisions today, right? And I always try to bring some comments, say, you know what? Do you really need to make this decision today or could it, be, could it wait another week or a month or two months? You really have to ask this question. Do not make decisions prematurely, right? Because when it comes time to make a decision, you may have more data. I, every decision has a probability of being wrong. The only way you can improve the odds of it being right, you can collect some d additional data to help you in making that decision. Now, I'm not saying don't make a decision. Absolutely never be afraid of making a decision, but make sure that you understand that this decision should not be postponed. Or can you make half a decision today and I can postpone the other half of the, de the decision making, but I have more information, right? As a product manager, you have to improve your odds of success. One of the ways in which you can improve your odds of success is postponing making decisions that don't need to get made, right? It does not mean that I'm advocating procrastination, right? I'm not doing that. I wanna make a decision, but I wanna make the decision absolutely at the last point in time I can actually make it, right? So every decision has the right time, and this is why having good program managers who are very different than product managers. You know, program managers are the schedule people, right? Those people will help you understand what decision needs to get made when, right? Have a good solid program manager to work with you to help you understand what needs to get decided at what point in time, right? And sometimes, you know, you can even argue with pro uh, program managers and say, you know what, I can postpone this decision or I can make 80% of it now and the remaining 20% I can postpone making that, right? So just-in-time decision-making is extremely important. And a product manager, right, you have to get, become used to being uncomfortable, right? If you don't like stress and you run away from stress, don't be a product manager because you're going to have, you're living by definition, you're seeking uncertainty, right? You're taking a lot of risk, as I said, every day, right? You have to enjoy being uncomfortable, right? You have to enjoy going to work and say, you know what, I don't know what's gonna come hit me today, right? I may have some surprises for me and I will guarantee you will have surprises every day if you're doing product management. Not everything goes, you know, nothing goes per plan. When you're building a product, nothing will go to a plan, right? You know, the first, uh, what do they say? You know, you get into battle and the, all the battle plans are kind of blown up, right? The same thing happens when you're building a product. You may have a nice plan. Your program manager gives you a nice big Gantt chart and all this other stuff. And the first day, engineers start working on it and you start sharing it with customers. All of that goes haywire, right? So you really have to learn to keep calm even when all of this stuff is happening around you, right? So you have to learn to become comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Butterflies in the stomach and people screaming at you and all of this other stuff, you just get comfortable with it because people are going to read your body language and when, you, when I'm stressed, I make five other people stressed around me and then the entire team comes to a standstill, right? So you really can't do that. That is uh, something that's extremely important. And the last part is you've got to enjoy the spotlight, right? Whether good or bad, right? You as a product manager own the product. You own the outcomes, as I said. And what that means, you're going to have the spotlight on you. Wherever you go, there's going to be this little spotlight on you running behind you, right? Everywhere. Something goes wrong, everybody's going to know Sanjay messed it up. Right? And when, everybody's, when the product is successful, you have to learn to make sure you acknowledge and reward and appreciate all the people who helped you make it that way. Right? There's an engineering team, there's a sales team, there's a supply chain team. You know, all of those people, of course, are critical people. A product manager doesn't typically have all of these people reporting to this person. So you really, because you want to build another product, you want to use the same team to do something else, right? So you have to learn to share the good, but absorb all the bad stuff, right? Learn to take all the lumps and kind of share all the good stuff with, uh, with everybody. You really have to become good at doing that, right? You can't offer, as a product manager, will never offer, an ex offer excuses as to why something didn't go right or why something is delayed or why something, you know, whatever happened, right? You can't. 
just have to own it and move on. Uh, and so you have to really be able to thrive in that and be, love the spotlight. If you are the one who runs away, hides under the table when stuff happens, then you, know, you should think about, is this really for me, right? Uh, but it's a very fulfilling job, by the way. Product management is by far the most satisfying, at least for me, you know, when you see a product that you engineer on the shelf, right? Or you can go see it on Amazon. The thrill that you get, right, is absolutely amazing. I tell people there's no high like seeing a product that you built on the shelf someplace, right? That your kids can buy it, you can go show it to your parents, they can go buy it. Uh, uh, you can see strangers on the street use it. You know, I was surprised. I was at Costco yesterday, right? This is another one of those products I built. This is uh, more than 10 years old now, right? And even yesterday, I see one of the Costco employees wearing this headset, right? Which was amazing to me, right? You know, this is one of actually, one of the first Bluetooth headsets that actually had a case. And I can tell you how we came up with this idea of a case. It was all product management driven rather than engineering driven. Uh, and I immediately noticed it, right? You know, this guy, I can't even buy this product anymore, but he's wearing it, right? And it made my day, hey, look, somebody's still using my product, which is, which is awesome, right? You know, that you have to appreciate and enjoy uh, that you made a difference at the end. I learned a lot. I learned nothing from a book because none of these books existed like you know, 20 years ago when I started doing this. But there's a lot of good books out there today that you can read where you can learn from other people's wisdom that they have learned, right? Their experiences. Uh, go read the stuff. But I've also learned there's only one way to really learn it. Reading books is great, right? But there's only one way to learn, which is? By doing it, yeah, that's the only way. You're gonna learn tennis by sitting, uh, watching YouTube videos or reading the theory of tennis? No, if you don't go to the court and hit some balls, you're never gonna learn it, right? Right, you know, uh, Andre Agassi's dad I heard was like made him hit 3,000 balls every day, right? You need to practice, practice, practice. So if you think you're gonna become a product manager by reading books or listening to somebody or me giving you advice, no. The only way you're gonna do it and become good at it is by actually doing it, right? So practice it. Product management is one of those things. Engineering, you can learn by reading a book and you can learn some theory. Product management, there's no chance. You gotta go and do it. You gotta go out there and put yourself out there Practice, do it, learn, make some mistakes, get a bloody nose every now and then, and that's how you're gonna go, right? You know, I call product management is like baseball, right? You know, not everything that you do will be successful. Not every time a batter goes into the batter's box, he's gonna hit a home run, right? If you can hit a couple every now and then, that's probably good, right? Uh, and that's the mindset that you need to have is, if I don't do this, if I don't get down and get my hands dirty, you will never succeed, right? So do it, make yourself vulnerable, put yourself in situations which are inherently uncomfortable and, and you'll become good at it. At the end, it's like most other things in life. If you do it often enough, you will get really good at it, right? But this is one of those things where I really strongly believe it's the experience that matters having done it multiple times. Every time you do something, you learn, you iterate, you understand what went wrong, what went right, and improve, right? Uh, let me tell you about this product actually, which is uh, really, let me go back a little bit, right? So this product was designed when Bluetooth headsets were only used by men, largely, right? And so when we're looking and saying, how many are we gonna sell, we realize we're not selling to half the world, right? My total market, addressable market is only half because only I'm selling it to men, not women, right? Women are wearing jewelry, women are doing everything. They don't want this ugly Bluetooth headset on their ear, right? And the other thing is, men have pockets where they can put their Bluetooth headset. Women typically don't have pockets, 
right? They have a purse and they put this in a purse and they can't find it. So we created this cool little jewel box, right? Where you can put your product in, you create something that is actually not even visible. It can hide you know, beneath the hair. And by the way, it still works, right? If you hide it beneath, in, inside the, ear, the hair someplace and the microphones don't work, that's a big problem, right? Then why? I think you're insane because you're talking to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's so right? So, and that's how we came up with this, right? In fact, the test was when we launched this product, you know, 11 years ago, roughly, we created two products. One was this product, which was low on features, but had this cool case with a battery charging thing in it and you can, you know, nice jewel case that I had so many friends say, Sanjay, my wife is asking for this. Can I have one? Can I have one? We sold so many. This was the hottest selling headset 10 years ago, roughly, when we designed it because it was the force of its kind. And we had another one with like four microphones and all this crazy noise cancellation stuff and blah, blah, blah. This product, even though it had less features, oversold that product by, I think, two to one, right? So it just says, you know, the job of a product manager. If you let engineers do it, they would have just kept putting more and more features. No, we need to do a different level of thing. I'm gonna do the easy stuff. I don't need this four microphone stuff and all the firmware stuff. Just give me a simple case, right? Where I can put this thing, now it has a small battery so I can charge it. It's more comfortable because it's not very heavy, all of this other stuff, right? Now this has become, everybody has it. This is the other thing. This is another interesting product, by, by the way, I'll tell you. So this is, I couldn't, f I have one at home, I couldn't find it today. Uh, this was a product, I don't know, if everybody probably knows what this thing is today. Yeah, it's a power bank, right? But this was done in 2005, right? And in those days, you know, Motorola was, we were just coming out of our Razor. You know, remember the Motorola Razor? How many of you remember that phone? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was. I sold cell phones during that period. Yeah, so awesome, awesome product, right? And selling replacement batteries for that phone was about a $120 million business for Motorola, just replacement batteries, right? And there comes the smartphone, right? Just about that time frame. After that, and we're looking at this and saying, whoops, this entire $120 million business is going, going away, right? Nobody wants replacement batteries. These batteries are not replaceable because however these phones are getting built, right? So me, as a product manager for that business of selling replacement batteries, I have only two options. I don't have a job and I get thrashed by my CFO and my CEO, or I go figure out something else, right? And we said, you know, so we stood back for a second and said, okay, my razor used to last a week without a battery uh, getting recharged. My smartphone only lasts a day. Okay, so even if I don't need a replacement battery, the need for battery has not gone away, right? What product do we create to serve that itch, which we know is there, right? This is when we came up. There was no battery bank in the world at that point in time. This is what we came up, and we said, you know what? This is what people need. I just need to put battery in a little case and sell it so people can charge their battery in the phone that they can't replace with something from the outside, right? The number of people used to carry two batteries, one in their back so that when the battery runs out on their razor, they would just swap the battery, and there you go, right? So again, this is not a product that engineers did, right? This is a product that I call it, you know, consumer-driven innovation that product managers have to drive in the organization. They really have to see, okay, who am I selling to? What am I selling? What is their need? The need was very simple. Guys, I need my phone charged all the time, right? Previously, I used to have spare batteries. Now I need to have something else, right? After that, it's relatively straightforward to build this, right? And by the way, this product is great because retailers love it. It's such a simple thing. It never comes back, right? So you can sell a product, it has great margin, you take a $2 battery in it, you sell it for 50 and everybody's happy. Everybody's making a lot of money on this, right? So anyways, you know, so a product manager, right? You know, what I tell now, you know, even, even though I started out as a geek and I, I always tell people now, I really like to think of what does the consumer want, 
right? And then we will go figure out aligning the rest of the stars, but I think understanding what a consumer is willing to pay for. Start from there, it typically makes for a more successful business rather than looking to say, I have this cool technology, now let me go figure out what to do with it and who to sell it to, right? Uh, maybe I will work compensated to the other side. No, there's no wrong or right way, by the way, right? It happens, there are enough products that come from technology first, there are enough products that come from consumer need first, or there are enough products that come from, hey, I know I can make some money doing this, so let me go do this, right? And then I can go make the other stuff aligned. 